I want to preach to you today. I'm going to go from the book of Genesis. So if you'll go there and get ready, uh, Genesis chapter 4, and we'll start with verse 3. But before we do that, let's pray. Father, we're grateful for your word. God, it's more than a book. It became flesh and dwelt among us. I ask today, God, that you let it abide in us and change us. We're so appreciative for the opportunity you give us, God, to share your word. We pray, Father, that you'll just let it do its work in each heart. And we give you thanks in Jesus' name. Amen. So I want to speak to you today on this topic, doing what's right in a world that's gone wrong. Would you say that with me? Doing what's right in a world that's gone wrong. How many of you have ever struggled with doing what's right? If your hand's not up, you're just not telling the truth. <laughs> we, we've all struggled. We've all struggled with doing what's right. And this, if, if you go all the way back to the garden, when God creates man, he makes man and he puts man in a perfect world. I want you to think about it. There, you, you don't have to worry about sandburrs, <laughs> no thorns, no thistles. It's a perfect world in harmony with God and in harmony with man. It's something when you can pet a lion and not have to worry about being on the menu. And so it was a perfect place. But something happened. Eve got talked into something. You, you need to be careful who you're listening to because who you're listening to can get you into trouble. Can anybody relate? I, I think I shared a few weeks ago about my son that when he had a friend over at the house and they, Jonathan knew better, but his friend didn't. And he talked Jonathan into slipping out. They climbed out their, his bedroom window and took off out in the neighborhood and were messing around. And I woke up and went in to check on him and I saw they were gone. So the next thing I did was get in the car and start driving around looking for him. My son saw me and he said, oh man. He said, we got to get back home. And so they run back home and they climb back in the window and I come back in and open the door and they're <laughs> I said, and so I got them up and I, I, I looked at the boy that had spent the night and I said, son, the best thing you could do is probably go home right now. And he got up and went home. And I talked to my son and I said, now, you know you're in trouble, but I want to make sure you understand the why. And years later, Jonathan came back to me and the, the boy that had done the slipping out, ended up in drugs and in prison, and Jonathan came to me and said, Dad, I'm so glad that you let me know what was right. Now hear me, because just because you get something wrong doesn't mean that God can't straighten it out. And that, that boy, that boy that was in drugs and in prison is preaching the gospel today and uh, making a difference. So thank God for his word. Adam and Eve get talked, or Eve gets talked into by uh, Satan, and she eats from a tree that she wasn't supposed to eat from. I want you to think about this. It was a tree of knowledge of good and evil. God never wanted us exposed to evil. He wanted us to be able to live. You know, when you're a kid, uh, if sometimes being a child is a, a special time because a lot of times you're not aware of any turmoil or any stuff that's going on and you you can now that has that's not the way it was for every child growing up but that's what God wants he didn't want us exposed to evil but when they ate of that tree and then God puts them out of the garden being put out of the garden was not a punishment you say well, well sure no no he why did he put them out of the garden the scripture said that he put them out of the garden because he didn't want them to eat the tree of life and they would live forever. I want you to think about this. If God had allowed them to eat the tree of life, they would live eternally separated from God. And that was not God's plan. 
God wanted to bring us back to himself. Aren't you glad? Amen. And so when sin entered in, I thought about this. I thought about how the, the profound impact that sin had, not just on humanity. I mean, when you look in the world that we're living in today, it, it, it's going off the rails. There are people that are going up and murdering strangers. I mean, just, you know, you hear it in the news all the time that they had no connection, didn't know any, didn't know them, and just attacking. And so sin runs rampant. It has a profound impact, not on just humanity, but on the world itself. It produced thorns and thistles, toil and labor, death and destruction. Sin separated them from God. Hear me but it did not separate God from them. When they sinned, they ran and they hid from God, but my friend, God was still looking for them. Aren't you glad that you serve a God today, that when you mess up, he doesn't give up on you, he doesn't throw you away, he comes looking for you because he wants to bring you back to him. Everybody say, bringing me back. God did not give up on man. He made a way for man to come back to him. Now, Cain, Adam and Eve are put out of the garden, and they have children, Cain and Abel. They grow up, and Abel becomes a shepherd, and Cain becomes a tiller of the ground. He he's, uh, plants crops and harvests them. I want to show you something here. It says, this is in Genesis 4 and verse 3, when they grew up and they were doing these things, it said, and when the time for harvest, and when it was time for the harvest, Cain presented some of his crops. Everybody say that with me, some of his crops. The reason I'm pausing here is because the language here is very important. Cain presented some of his crops as a gift to the Lord. Abel also brought a gift the best portions of the firstborn lambs from his flock everybody say firstborn the lord accepted abel and his gift but he did not accept cain and his gift this made cain very angry and he looked dejected why are you so angry the lord asked why do you look so dejected you will be accepted if you do what is right now so the question becomes well what was right why does he receive Abel's offering and not Cain's offering you see it in the language Abel brought the firstborn of his flock in other words he put God first but when it came to Cain, Cain didn't bring him the first fruit of his flock. I mean, I'm sorry, of his crop. He just brought some of the crop. And so, it's, it, can I tell you this? It doesn't matter how much you go to church. If God is not first in your heart, you're going to find heartache and heartbreak, and you're going to struggle to do what's right because he will not be second. God is not going to take a second seat to our desires or our wants. He wants to be first. Well, what right does he have to be first? How about he created you? <laughs> How about that we're, he's the reason that we live and we breathe and we have our being? He, and and this, is, this is what I want you to get, man. God wants Cain to get it. He said, Cain, what are you angry about? If you do what's right, if you'll just put me first, you'll be accepted. But Cain doesn't do that. Watch this. Because Cain chooses not to put God first, he finds himself slipping further and further away from God until now his heart is so twisted he murders his own brother. And why does he lash out at Abel? Because God accepted him. We've got to be careful in the world that we live not to allow bitterness to fill our hearts because bitterness will take us further and further away from God God wants us to come to him 1636 years passed from the time of Adam 
until there was a worldwide flood. What happened? The world completely forgot God. Look in Genesis 6, verses 5 and 6. The Lord observed the extent of human wickedness on the earth, and he saw that everything they thought or imagined was consistently and totally evil. I want you to get that for a second. Anybody in here ever have an evil thought? Don't you make me stand up here with my hand up alone. <laughs> you, you, you know, you're not, you're not going to get through life without thinking some things that are wrong, right? But here's the difference. is the world had gotten so degraded that was in a place that everybody's mind continually was on evil. Nobody was thinking good. Everybody had completely forsaken God. If you think the world is rough here, you should have seen it there. You remember Sodom and Gomorrah and what happened? I, I want you to think about when, when you get to the point that you can't discern that you've got men trying to rape angels. See, we don't, we don't think about that, but I'm telling you, and then we say, oh, well, we'll look at that. Well, what about when all of a sudden I've got murder in my heart and I've got hatred towards you and I don't, do you understand if you don't love me, you ain't going there? What are you talking about? Because the scripture said that we cannot be forgiven unless we forgive. I said we don't anybody get excited. We can't be forgiven unless we forgive. What's God saying? God's saying, no, you're going to have to exercise my character if you're going to live in harmony with me. You've got to learn how to do what's right in a world gone wrong. How many of you have ever been wrong before? Anybody ever been wrong? Somebody cheated you out of some money? Somebody lied to you? Somebody cut you off in traffic and you chased them for a quarter mile. <laughs> you know, got, got wronged. Well, listen, just because things are going wrong doesn't mean you have to join in with it. What did your, what, can I tell you what my daddy used to tell me? And I wasn't raised in church. My daddy used to tell me two wrongs don't make a right. Sure felt like it. <laughs> sure felt like if somebody popped me, I ought to pop them back and that would make it right. But that wasn't how it worked. And so in the midst of this world that has completely abandoned God, that has completely forsaken him, that does not have the ability to think about God, that, is, that has turned completely away from God to the point that their thought is totally evil, God looks down and he finds an individual down in that world that is still loving on God, that still desires God, that even though everything around him is going wrong, he's trying to stand and do what's right. And when when God saw that, he's drawn to a man by the name of Noah, and the Bible said that Noah found grace in the eyes of the Lord. Wow. You know what grace is, don't you? Unmerited favor of God. Let me explain to you this way. Mercy withholds what you deserve. Grace gives you what you don't deserve. So you're at home. Mom told you, to keep your hand out of the cookie jar, or you're getting a whipping. Fifteen minutes later, mom walks in, and there you are, elbow up to oatmeal and raisin. And all of a sudden, mercy withholds the spanking. Mercy withholds what you deserve, but grace gives you the cookie. Grace gives you what you don't deserve. And it wasn't that Noah was perfect. He wasn't. It wasn't that Noah had everything right. He didn't. But Noah had a heart that was hungry for God and wanted to do what was right. And when God saw that, he gave Noah what he didn't deserve and made a way of escape for Noah and his family. How many of us have ever asked God, or let me just say it this way, how many of us have ever wanted 
a fresh start or a new day. Any of you ever want to do over? I've spent some money at carnivals. What are you talking about? They suck you in, man. Put your dollar down for three balls. All you got to do is get the ball in the milk jug. And it took me about 20 bucks before I figured out the ball doesn't fit in the milk jug. <laughs> I need a do-over. Now, look, God doesn't do that. God doesn't deceive you. He doesn't, he, he, he doesn't set you up for failure. But he sets you up for success. That's why Christ came, so we could have victory. <laughs> And so when we desire a do-over, God is able to bring that to us. Everyone wants to be able to start new. And I got some good news for you. With God, you can. I said, with God, you can. The scripture, go ahead, give him a hand. Amen. Thank God. The scripture says that Saul was 30 years old when he became king of Israel. And he reigned for 42 years. And when Saul started out, he started out right. He started out humble. And he started out wanting to do what God wanted. But in the 42 years something happens his heart gets off and when his heart gets when his heart when our heart's not right then we end up doing what's not right and so i i thought about when they went to anoint saul if you study scripture you find out that he went and he hid himself he didn't feel worthy. He, he was a head and shoulders taller than everybody else. And when they got ready to anoint him, he didn't do a John Wayne to the front and say, lay it on me. I'm, he didn't do that. He hid. And they had to go find him. God told him where he was at. And they brought him out and they anointed him to be king. And, and he was very humble. But all of a sudden, here's the danger. When we begin to take God for granted we can begin to lose our heart's connection with God. When all of a sudden we forget how good God's been to us. I, I, I'll tell you the truth, man. This is past week. I, I, I was thinking about back last summer when I, when I would have died if it hadn't been for God. And I, and I, and I just broke and I, it was just me by myself there. But I wanted to let God know how much I loved him and how much I thanked him for rescue. <laughs> uh, and you're not going to get through life without needing rescue, friend. If you try to float your own boat, you're going to sink. You're going to, ha you're going to have to let him be the captain of your ship to be able to navigate. And so I needed him, and I was thanking him for it. And, 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 and Saul gets messed up, and he loses track. And it, it, it tells about it in 1 Samuel 13 and verse 13. Samuel, the prophet, speaking to Saul, he said, How foolish! You have not kept the command of the Lord your God. Had you kept it, the Lord would have established your kingdom over Israel forever. But now your kingdom must end, for the Lord has sought a man after his own heart. God's not looking for the smartest person in the room. He's not looking for the strongest person in the room. He's not looking for the most courageous or, 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 or the most adventurous. He's just looking for somebody that will raise their hands and love him and say, I want you more than I want anything else in my life. When we put God first, it creates a bond with our heart in heaven, and God is drawn to that. Who was that man that God found? <laughs> I love this. It, it, it's a boy, a teenager, sitting out on a hillside with a bunch of sheep. And if you read this scripture, if you go on and read the rest of it, it said that God has already chosen him and anointed him. Hear me. 
In God's mind, it was a done deal. Everybody else may be putting you out on a hillside someplace and saying, you're not important enough to even bring into the house for supper. But God's saying, we're not sitting down till they show up because that boy's got a heart that I want. A man that's after his own heart. David's not perfect. He's going to mess up. David has sinned. But when they bring David's sin before him, David repented before God and said, God, I'm sorry. David has a connection. Let me say it this way, a heart connection to God. Not a head connection, but a heart connection to God. When your heart is hungry for God, you'll embrace what's right even when others tell you it's wrong. I, I can't tell you how many of my friends thought I'd flipped out when I got saved. I, could, I had some other friends that flipped out when they found out I was pastor in the church. <laughs> I had a guy call me up and he said, Rick, there's a rumor going on about you. And I said, it's true. I didn't even wait for him to finish. He said, are you kidding me? He said, are you pastor in the church? I said, yeah, nobody's any more surprised than I am. <laughs> it's, it's, it's just about not doing what you want, but what you feel God pulling on your heart for and drawing you to. And so David, <laughs> David has already been anointed by God before he's ever been noticed by man. I like that about God. God doesn't wait for somebody else to see you. He sees you. He sees you when you're hurting. He sees you when you're questioning, God, why is this happening to me? And he's trying to whisper to us through his word, this was not my intent for your life. God gets blamed for a lot of things that he never did. When, when sin entered the world, it brought death and destruction. So the result of that we see all around us, but sometimes what we fail to see is that God is still there reaching for us to bring us in, to redeem us, to bring us back to that place with him. When Israel is facing a giant... David's brother Eliab tells him that he has an evil heart. It's in 1 Samuel 17 and 28. This is the Amplified. Now Eliab, his oldest brother, heard what he said to the men, and Eliab's anger burned against David. And he said, why have you come down here? With whom did you leave those few sheep in the wilderness? I know your presumption, overconfidence, and the evil of your heart, for you have come down in order to see the battle. There's always somebody that's going to try and put you down for doing what's right. <laughs> always somebody that's going to try and diminish you and discourage you, but you've got to get that heart <laughs> like David had. And when all of a sudden he starts telling him he's evil, David looked at him and said, what have I done now? <laughs> Well, I can relate to that. I had two brothers at home. <laughs> what, what have I done now? What's he doing? David's saying, I am not going to allow what you're saying to me to get in my spirit and discourage me. I'm going to shake it off. Because as long as you, you've been here for 40 days, Eliab, and that giant just keeps on showing up. You haven't moved an inch. So don't try and keep me from doing what God has called me to do. When you've got a heart for God, you'll stand up to the giants and make sure that they're removed so people can find victory in Jesus. Yes. Amen. Amen. Saul rejoiced when David killed Goliath, but it wasn't long until he was trying to kill David. Why? Because his heart got messed up. Any of you ever met somebody with a messed up heart? You know what I'm talking about? I mean, I don't care how kind you are. 
Anger is going to come. Bitterness is going to come. Don't, don't judge the person. Pray. Because you, you need to remember our hearts were there. And so, Saul is now hunting David down in the mountains like he's some escaped convict. He wants to murder him, but God protects David. I want you to remember the scripture said, if God be for you, who can be against you? God's protecting David. Not only is God protecting David, but check this out. On more than one occasion, David has the opportunity to kill Saul. David and his men are in the mountains hiding in a cave. Saul's army has come out. They ran into a cave to hide. So, <laughs> I'm telling you, only God can set this up. Saul goes in the cave to relieve himself. He is in a compromised position. <laughs> his men, David's men are in the back of the cave going, Hey, <laughs> God just delivered him into your hand. Go up there and kill him. Now, I got to tell you, I'm going to be real transparent. It would have been hard for me to not believe that. See, I'm telling you, doing what's right isn't always easy. Sometimes it's hard to figure out what's right. I mean, this guy's been hunting me down like a dog, man, and, and now he's right, he's right. And I, I get, but David, there's something about his heart that won't let him because it's connected to God. He even feels smitten in his heart when he snuck up while Saul's relieving himself. David sneaks up and cuts off part of his garment. And then when Saul walks out and he gets away from the mountain, David stands out the mouth of the cave holding up that piece of garment and said, I could have killed you today. And Saul repents. He's, and he tells him, I, I won't seek you anymore. He's lying because <laughs> his heart's still messed up. Matter of fact, next time Saul brings his army out seeking for David, they, they camp out and Saul's in the middle of them all and they fell asleep. And David looks at a young man and said, will you go down here with me to the camp? He said, yeah, I'll go. And, and, and God caused such a deep sleep to fall on them. They go walking between soldiers and get to Saul. And Saul's got a spear stuck in the ground right by his head. That young man's right there, and he's saying, David, let me kill him. Let me kill him. The Lord has delivered him into your hand. It's hard not to believe that. It's hard sometimes to discern that's not God. That God's not going to harm. That's not God. And so David says, no, don't do it. Take the spear, but don't touch him because he's the Lord's anointed. And I'm telling you that he, he, David gets this. David says the Lord will cause him to fall in battle or, or one day something's going to happen, but my hand won't be on him. I'm telling you, that's a man after God's own heart. I said, that's a man after God's own heart. Don't y'all sit there and act like you ain't never thought about it. I thought about, yeah, I'm going to let him have it right now. And, and, and God gave me the opportunity. No, God is not going to use us to try and destroy someone else. He knew it wasn't right. So here's my question. In the day and the hour that we live in, how are we able to know what's right and wrong? See, folks think, that, oh, that's just some easy task. David is wrestling with that. All of his men believe this is right, this is what God wants, but David knew it wasn't. So how do we determine that? The Scripture, Proverbs 14 and 12 tells us, there is a way which seems right to a man and appears straight before him, but its end is the way of death. Now, in John 8 and 31, Jesus lays out how we know what's right. He makes a statement. He, he says to those that believed in him, he said, You are truly my disciples if you remain faithful in my teachings, and you will know the truth, and the truth will set you free. The truth of his word 
sets us free and shows us the right way. I said, the, can you imagine? This, this, this hasn't changed. Folks get upset about this. I'm thinking, that ain't my word. That's his. I've had folks get upset. I said, wait a minute, man. I'm not giving you my opinion. I'm giving you the word of God. There it is right there. But what happens is sometimes we are so bent and, and, and have been gotten so far away from him that the further away we get from him, the harder it is to be able to receive the truth and to find yourself free. I'm telling you today that God loves us so much that he would rather die for us than and live without us you'll know the truth and the truth will make you free listen to what paul says in romans 12 and 1 and so dear brothers and sisters i plead with you to give your bodies to god because of all he's done for you let them be a living and holy sacrifice the kind he will find acceptable this is truly the way to worship him don't copy the behavior and customs of this world but let god transform you into a new person by changing the way you think then you will learn to know god's will for you what which is good and pleasing and perfect we are transformed by the spirit of god and his word and his word you say, well, you, you, that's easy for you. You're a pastor. You're a preacher. I wasn't always a preacher. You didn't know me when I was a rascal. You didn't know me back then. And I wasn't raised in church. Well, what changed your life when I got into this book? It changed my life. I, I, didn't, I didn't go to Sunday school. I, I, you know, I'd been a couple times, you know, when I was a kid. But I, I, didn't, I wasn't raised that way. But when I got hungry for God, when all of a sudden something, I felt something in my heart that I could not explain away. And I was trying to go to church and go do the disco, you know, and all that stuff. And then I thought, I, I can't do this anymore. And I remember getting down and I said, God, how can I live for you? I, I, I need to understand your word. And I'm telling you, when I picked it up... I, because I had read it before, but I wasn't getting anywhere. When I picked it up that time, I, I felt like a wind blowing over me. Uh, and I knew that God uh, was revealing himself to me uh, through how oh, there's a difference between trying to get this in your head uh, and get it in your heart. When it gets in your heart, it changes you. When we desire to do what's right, the word of God connects our heart to him. It becomes more than a book to you. You know, we have, uh, how many of you have a cell phone? If you don't, go get one. <laughs> no, I'm kidding. No. <laughs> uh, on your cell phone, I, I don't know if you're aware of this, but on your cell phone is a global positioning system. It means you can be tracked. As a matter of fact, my wife tracks me. She did something to my phone called me up the other day and said so what are you doing at such and such <laughs> how do you know that I, I got you and I remember her taking my phone and, 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 and fixing it up and so she knows where I'm at <laughs> that global positioning system lets us know where we are and where we're going gives us direction to where we're going I haven't cracked open a, a what's all I can't even remember the name of it yeah, but what do they call it? Yeah, the guy's name. Randall. See, poor Randall's out of business, man. He's, a, you know, that GPS came in and everybody forgot about Randall and they're just working with Siri now. And so it, it tracks us. It lets us know where we are and how to get where we're going. Unless it gets interference. Just a few weeks ago, we had some solar flares. And those solar flares interrupted the satellite connection to that gps so for a few moments we couldn't tell where we were at couldn't tell lost the direction of where we were going and if you're not careful that could happen when you need it most and you wind up lost so what are you driving and i'm telling you that this word has connected my heart to him it lets me know it's God's provision 
for safety. GPS. It gives me direction so I don't get lost. But if I allow bitterness to get in my heart, if I allow unforgiveness to get in my heart, those are not solar flares, those are Satan flares. And they will break my ability to communicate with God just like that solar flare broke the ability for the satellite to communicate with the phone. What are you saying? I'm saying I got to keep my heart right. I got to make sure that I'm connected to God. And the only way I can do that is if I stay in his word and through prayer. Everybody say, read, read. and pray. But now hear me, hear me a second, because sometimes we're reading this like it's a regular book. It's not a regular book. This is life. This is so powerful. And when you open your heart to God, it begins to speak to you in ways you never thought could happen. If we conform to the world's way of thinking, we're going to wind up lost. Noah didn't find God's grace by following after the world. David did not become a man after God's own heart by filling his heart with worldly pleasures. David became a king because he had a king. His name is Jesus. Would you stand with me today? I wonder today how many of you, you know, there's a, there's a scripture in Bible where it talks about that Israel had no king, and every man did that was, right, that was right in his own eyes. If I don't make Jesus the king of my heart, if I don't allow him to rule and reign in the throne of my heart, then I've got no idea where I'm going. The only way to do what's right in a world that's gone wrong is to make him king. Revelation 19, 11 and 16. Now I saw heaven opened and behold a white horse and he who sat on him was called faithful and true and in righteousness he judges and makes war and he has on his robe and on his thigh a name written, King of Kings and Lord of of lords you pastor you telling me that he makes war absolutely he's fighting the enemy of our soul he's fighting against those that want to destroy us and 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 deplete us and and cause us to be lost and all I've got to do is say here I am God here I am God 